the message title for this morning, I've, I've quizzed you since the very beginning of our morning together. What are the two words? Critical moments. Critical moments. <coughs> it's in your bulletin. It's in your thoughts. And before we leave this morning, my goal, God's goal, God's hope, God's promise, is that you leave with a message in your heart. It, it comes to us from the book of Acts. Pop quiz, who wrote the book of Acts? Luke. I heard it. Luke. Some people say it's the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke because it picks up where Jesus left off and where we take over. Okay, with that, Who brought their Bibles this morning? Great you did. I knew you were going to ask that. You did. Good. And I didn't bring mine intentionally. I just said I was going to rely on you today. Let me read it, me read it to you. <laughs> Chapter 8, the verses 14 through 17. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, when Peter and John arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. The power of God, the incredible power of God. Let me tell you this morning why I believe that this passage is extraordinarily important to every Gentile faith community, and that would be who? All of us. All of us. Everybody. Everybody that's not Jewish. To every Gentile faith community. To do that, I want to review the first couple of lines in that passage. Samaria had accepted the word of God and had been baptized. If you just read that quickly, what would you think? There's somebody that read the word of God and accepted it. Who, who were the Samaritans? The Samaritans were the, the people that this were despised by all of Israel because some 750 years before Christ, God's people, the Israelites, intermarried with those of no faith, pagans. And in doing so, they polluted and they corrupted the, the, the religion of Israel. Because of that, centuries and centuries of hard feelings grew stronger and bolder. I'm reminded of that old story of our country, the Hatfields and the McCoys. We have personal friends who are McCoys. And they would say to you, that's not what happened. And you say, what did happen? And they go, I don't know, but it's not what happened. They didn't even know why they were upset with them. Because after centuries of feuding together, all they knew is we're not supposed to like Samaritans. And then God comes along and places a, a story on our heart of the good Samaritan. You mean there are good people in the ones we don't like? Because if we don't like the whole of you, we probably don't like you. And, and then Jesus tells this story about the good Samaritan who helped one who despised not only him but all of his people. And for the church, the early church, the Jews as well as who had become the first Christians, for them to respond to Samaria was a miracle in itself. So, what's going on around this story, it kind of adds fuel to this fire as well. 
if you were to read before and after a little bit, which I encourage you to do as you as you leave this place, you take your Bibles out when you get home and, and read around it so you don't get you don't take things out of context because you need to understand that there was there was there were things going on before and after these couple of verses. Because you see on the page before our text, there was an altercation and a salvation of a pagan magician named Simon. Now, now, we think of magicians and we think of a show and we think of how entertaining it is. But in their day, magicians <coughs> seem to have a power, a divine power of some kind. But divine does not always mean of God. And Simon had made such an impression on the people of Samaria. They were starting to follow and worship him. There were many examples of growth of the kingdom that shook the foundation of, of all the apostles, but this is one of note. So now you understand what was going on before. And now back to our passage where we're talking about Peter and John were sent. Well, you know who Peter and John were. You know who they were in the early church. They were the leaders of the fact that they were sent is a wow. You saw this is important enough to send two of the big guns to take care of the problem. <coughs> they were the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. Peter was one of the vocal mouthpieces of all of Christianity. And they were the ones sent to people who were accepting and believing and being baptized without the presence of the Holy Spirit. That is a problem for the early church. That is a problem today. If you are believing and reading and understanding and accepting and being baptized and not being impacted by your personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. So I ask you if you were Peter or, or, or John and you were going to Samaria, but wouldn't you be just a tiny, bit, a tiny bit skeptical about this journey, about this job, about this task? But they went and they opened an opportunity with the people of that community to be empowered by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It will not surprise you that on the way back to Jerusalem, they preach the good news. Fix the issue, preach the gospel. Sounds like every person's opportunity to share. Now you see where God is kind of leading us in this message for today. We all have our Samarias. And in these three verses, we as members of the faith community are, are called to go to uncomfortable places to expand the kingdom reach. And the Holy Spirit was with them and allowed this explosive growth of the kingdom or you wouldn't be here today. I just had one of those flashes. I'd like to think it was the Holy Spirit saying, tell them this. I'll make it very brief. You've all heard my story. But it took three times for God to call me before I responded. Was so many personal things were going on. I was busy. Candy was doing church work anyway. and Somebody had to support the family. And uh, Oh, by the way, I'm not really worthy enough. I don't know enough about the Bible. Remember, God, I'm the one that kept my my first Bible on the shelf without even separating the pages, so it would be a tribute to you. And I hardly know what it says inside except the stories I heard in Sunday school. And 
what changed my mind, and I hope it changes your hearts as well, is on that third time when God hits me over the back of the head with a two before, is that God says, silly boy, you're not going alone. Remember that line, and lo, I will be with you always. You can't face anything that I can't handle. And so I went. We are all going to have an accountability time for ourselves and for our faith community. And coming up very shortly, we're going to have a we're going to have a um, a gathering where we talk about who we are as a faith community and where our faith community is. In all the things that Jesus spoke of, taught about, overwhelmingly there are only two things, two categories of all of his messages. One was love. Anybody know what the second one? The second one was? Money. Of, of all the things that Jesus talked and taught, first was love, and, and second was money. You see, both of those are the key to expanding the kingdom, to growing God's kingdom outward. Starts right here in the hood. You see that understanding our financial needs is a, a way of understanding our ability to reach out. You're going to find out, you're going to know, you're going to understand that in the year 2015, we did not reach our financial needs, not dreams, needs, 10 out of 12 months of this year. And when we added new faces, smile if you're a new face, you only replaced somebody that was gone. Gone for many reasons. God calls us to a Christian duty that is stronger than attendance. Growth of wisdom becomes strength. Strength becomes courage. Courage becomes empowering of the Holy Spirit just like it did in Samaria. Had the Holy Spirit not gone with Peter and John, you wouldn't be here today. I'm going to share something with you that I don't normally share, but I'm not going to give names. I received a phone call last night late. Angry phone call of Distressed phone call, a hurting phone call. But it was someone who had experienced the Samaria experience themselves. Now here's how this works. Two weeks ago, this person was in our faith community for the first time. Well, the first time in a very long time. And the message, if I recall correctly, was uh, the wardrobe. It was talking about being empowered, putting on the, it's like the armor of God, but it was, it was God's helping you be ready to empower the world. It's about understanding and, and learning and, and growing your intellect so that you can be prepared. And when you walk out that door, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, protected by God. That message became a revelation. A salvation moment. A Holy Spirit moment for this person. That person turned their life around. Began praying. Changed all of the things that they were doing. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's not why they called. My call last night was to inform me that that person was going to move to a spiritual environment. Move to a spiritual environment. Wow, that for me. I thought we had a spiritual environment. But similar to the people of Samaria, they had heard the word, accepted the word, they'd been baptized, but they had not received the Holy Spirit. They felt blessings. 
They looked around, but they did not find direction. Direction they needed. Obviously, direction we need. A, a spiritual empowerment that is ours for the asking. And it is pleasing God when, when we are empowered and, and take advantage of that. And when we get serious about where we're going and what we're doing. Some of you may be thinking, hey, you win some, you lose some. Not every hit's a home run. But the truth is, we as turning point, this part of the kingdom, we are not pleasing God. Sisters and brothers, it's time in this part of the kingdom to fish or cut bait. It's time not only to hear the Word of God, not only to receive the Holy Spirit, but pay attention to the guidance and the direction and personally set out to accomplish the, the will that God has because you know, I know, we all know, God has a will for you. For us, but for you. Faithful attendance is not doing God's work. Before Peter and John went to Samaria, the magician named Simon was tricking people into following not God, his pagan hooligan. He was revered as divinely powered. God's word tells us that he was leading the people of Samaria in <coughs> pagan worship. And was being revered like a God. But when Peter and John went to Samaria with the Holy Spirit. And Simon saw what was going on. He wanted to buy from them the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that he could deceive and control people even greater than he had with tricks of being a magician. Francis Fenelon was a French Roman Catholic archbishop, a theologian, a poet, and a writer. I want to read you a quote from him. For most people, I ask very little. I try, though, to give them much more, but expecting nothing in return. I do very well in the bargain. Think about it. What is the motivation for faithfulness? You know that we select everything around you as you walk in to be bombarded uh, physically, mentally, spiritually by the message. Before this, we sang and listened and tapped our toes to Rascal Flats. The name of that song was changed. Let me read one line. I got off track, I made mistakes. I found myself in that place where souls get lost. It occurred to me that this could be a place where souls get lost as well as a place where souls get found. It can happen to anyone, anytime, anywhere, any place. It goes on to say, I gave it to God that day. I could finally see where I was going and it didn't matter where I'd been because I'm not the same now as I was then. Can you see where you're going? Can you see where God is leading you? Can you step back and look at the direction of your life? Can, can, you, can you take that direction of life and then overlay it with God's direction and say, I'm on track? You see, Jesus came as a role model for all of us. But the main thing that, that made Jesus a different human being 
was Jesus surrendered everything of who he was to who he could become in God's will. <coughs> you remember the Garden of Gethsemane? He was praying and the disciples fell asleep, but he was there. To, I've seen the picture, I've seen the photograph, I've seen the painting. He was there at a big rock. And he was on his knees and he was praying and he said, God, take this cup from me. I don't want to die. What did he say next? But if it is your will, if it is your will, I will. <coughs> It's not what I want. It's what you desire. It's all about grasping that concept of God's love, sisters and brothers. God can't love you more. But I'm here to tell you this morning that you can love God more. It's a critical time in your life, in the life of our faith community. Are you ready to ask God what God really desires for us? to do when we leave this place? Because well, that's a commitment. Actually, it's a critical moment. And the children say, Amen. Amen.